um, one of our um, invited speakers, Professor Bill Freeman um, from MIT. Uh, Bill has been a very prolific figure in basically in everything he touched, computer vision, computer graphics. He was doing computational photography before there was computational photography. Um, Bill uh, started out or burst into the scene uh, with his PhD work uh, with Ted Adelson on uh, steerable pyramids. You know, pyramids that, that now, you know, it's in everywhere. Every camera has, I'm sure, a pyramid implementation. And, 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 and Bill was uh, one of the people who really make it happen. Uh, Bill did the Kinet before the Kinet in 1995. Bill had this great system, very cheesy, where you would play video games with your hands. And, uh, and nobody ever thought anyone would do that, but uh, clearly Bill was just way ahead of his time. Um, he was uh, uh, instrumental in really producing workable algorithms for intrinsic in image problem, a problem that's very, very hard, but of course extremely interesting. Um, super resolution, denoising, uh, style and content, just the list goes on and on and on. But also, Bill is 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 a is a, is a philosopher of, of, of vision. <laughs> As all great philosophers, Bill thought about uh, all his career. He, he always had this idea, thinking, or was always thinking about the concept of time. And finally, he decided that he's going to you know share it with a wide audience with this brand new prepared talk just just for ICCP. Uh, where he will tell us uh, everything about time. Here you go. Thanks. <laughs> so you should just let Alyosha talk for the whole hour. <laughs> anyway, thanks. That's very sweet. Thank you, Alyosha. Um, OK. So yeah, I, I, I'm really, I've been excited about time lapse for a long time. And um, We've recently done some work in it. I want to show you that. And what I really wanted to do was to give a, so time lapse tells a story about photography over a certain time scale. And I thought for this talk, I would talk about how photography lets you tell a story about all sorts of time scales ranging from picoseconds up to centuries. And so I have to confess, I'm already, I'm already had the excitement of this. I had a great time preparing this talk, okay? No matter how it turns out, I had a good time preparing it. <laughs> um, and let's see. Also, this is my first time through with this talk. So one thing I expect to get from this talk is all sorts of comments from you, either during the talk or later, please. Um, uh, you know, saying, oh, but you missed this. Oh, this is so important, why didn't you mention that? So that would be great. And thank you for helping, me, uh, helping us all kind of fine tune this and make it more accurate. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the longer time scales because that's the part that I've been more involved with, but I do want to talk about the shorter time scales sort of for context, if nothing else. Now, mostly this talk will be about other people's work, but there'll be some things that will slip in there about, about my own group's work, and it's kind of like um, product placement in a movie. You know, you'll, you'll see, gee, why are they talking about that Coke can for so long? Is it really related to the plot? And so it'll be the same thing with these things that I'll slip in there. Um, okay, so let's go starting from the short time. Also, a real minor request. I forgot my, I left my uh, laser pointer in the bag in the hotel. If anyone has a laser pointer, I'd love to borrow it. Um, okay, so short time scales. Oh, wonderful. One of the few audiences where this would work. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so, you know, what's the shortest picture ever made? Well, I'm not sure, but here's a, a guess at what it might be. This is a picture of light. Um, so uh, this is made by um, Kabuta and, uh, um, and collaborators. Um, they, weren't the <laughs> they, <laughs> they weren't the first to do this. They, they cite Fujimoto and others um, for using this technique. But it's, um, it's really beautiful and simple. You uh, take a laser beam, break it into two paths. You have one pulse which you're imaging, and the other pulse is a reference beam which sweeps across at, the, at a grazing angle along the photographic plate, and you make a hologram by interfering those two beams. And, in, and so then the resulting hologram, if you, um, as you move your viewpoint along the hologram, 
you get a picture of time along that axis. And so here's the picture that you see in the hologram from different horizontal positions. Uh, you can see uh, this beam enter a, um, a diffraction grating, and it splits into three parts, and you can even see the secondary reflection. And so this is a photograph of light as it propagates. And this is, um, the laser pulses are on, on the order of 10 picoseconds. So that's the length, that's 10 picoseconds worth of light length there. So it gets, gives you a feel for the exposure time in, the, uh, in this image. Now in the next talk following this, don't go away. Uh, Ramesh Raskar will tell you his beautiful uh, high-speed imaging work as well. But I'll, I'll let him talk about that. Um, okay, so the next time scale, 10 to the ninth uh, nanoseconds. This, the piece of work that, I, that relates to that that I sh I'm going to show you doesn't really tell a story about events going on in nanoseconds, but it, but it uses nanosecond worth of technology, and that's these uh, time-of-flight depth cameras. So this is from uh, 3DV. They send out a short pulse of light, um, 50 centimeters worth, which is about, uh, one, about two nanoseconds. And it uh, hits the subject, bounces back, now distorted by the depth of the subject. And then they have a very fast quenching, very fast uh, gating mechanism, which stops the detection at this point in time. And so each pixel records this much light intensity, where now we've converted depth into intensity. And you get a, uh, an intensity image that tells you how far away everything is. Um, so again, it doesn't, it's not exactly telling a story about things going on in nanoseconds, but it uses nanosecond technology. And so here's uh, an image, and here's the depth image that results from that. Um, now we're going to really slow things down and get down to high-speed flash, which is on the order of uh, 1 to 200 microseconds, 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And now we're starting to really see things about the world that we have ordinary experience in, but seen from an entirely different viewpoint of, of high-speed flash photography. So what's needed to make this happen? Um, chemical or electronic flashes. And so th they're portable. And so now we get these beautiful pictures by, for example, Edgerton that reveal what happens when, when water leaves the faucet or... Uh, reveal the, the beauty of a gymnast, or we've all done this, shot a bullet through an apple, <laughs> um, you know, reveals what happens when a bullet goes through an apple, or, or all these other phenomena. Um, and, and I should say, these are the, uh, these are what we should aspire to as computational photographers. We want to make pictures that are as beautiful and as revealing as these are. Uh, and I went to Flickr and got some recent um, flash photography images, so these are sort of updated. <laughs> 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 projectile going through a yogurt <laughs> container. And, and here's, uh, this kind of looks like a cookie sneezing. <laughs> 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 but it's, uh, you know, a bullet being fired through a cookie. Um, okay, so now, now we slow it down again by another factor of a thousand, and we get to the range of exposures um, telling a story about what goes on in one five thousandth to one twenty-fifth of a second, say. So this is kind of the era of sort of normal photography. But of course, it's interesting to look back on where this began and what things were like when this began. This was photographs over these time scales were enabled by progress in emulsions uh, in film. And so in the late 1800s, you had Moray, uh, Marais and Moybridge uh, making these first time ever photographs of, of almost everyday phenomena, but again, revealing things that you, you can't see just by looking. So these are the, this is an early, um, uh, 12 frames per second camera. And um, so here are the images that you would get from that camera. Uh, the, uh, car the chamber would revolve um, and you get those 12 photos. And here's uh, one of the plates and here's what it would look like photographing a, a bird landing. And again, this reveals things that are just very difficult to see only by looking. Marais was really an artist and made these beautiful sculptures, uh, three-dimensional sculptures of, of a bird in flight. And these are this is my favorite thing. Um, of course, they're photographs, again, that reveal, now we're sort of getting, revealing things about things that happen at ordinary time scales. And his uh, competitor or colleague, Moybridge, also uh, was active during that time and 
made these famous photographs of horses to answer the question, are all four hooves of a galloping horse off the ground at the same time? And yes, they are. Um, Okay, so now it's slowed down again to uh, 1 25th to 1 second. Now, this is kind of a funny realm, and I, I couldn't really think of too many new things that were told by photography related to this time scale. Mostly, what comes to my mind regarding this time scale is, is photographic blur. Uh, so, so if you make images that are with exposures this long, you get a photograph like this, which indeed tell a story about a very brief instant of time. Um, here's the first product placement, I should say. You can use these stories, these photographs of blur to, to pull out what is moving in, this I in the image. So uh, with Ayan Chakrabarty and Hitler, we've done a local uh, analysis of the image in each region to identify which regions are likely to be blurred and which are not. And this lets you um, segment out the parts of the image that are slightly blurred and to um, estimate how, how much they are blurred in the, in the photograph. So you can uh, tell a little story about the motions that are going on. Okay, now we get to seconds and hours. Um, so this is, of course, there's been a lot of activity uh, in photography telling stories about things that happen in the order of seconds to the order of hours. And, and also by artists as well. And so there's, there's a, a kind of distinction here I want to make. So oftentimes that you have a time interval, maybe a few seconds or maybe a few hours, so from time one to time two. And it may be that the thing you're looking at is constant over that time interval. Then the appropriate thing to do may be to average the photographs over that or to select particularly revealing photographs from within that interval, assuming that everything that goes on within the, that interval is basically the same process. So that's, um, that's going to be the first three of these. And then in addition, you may assume that, what, that things are changing over that interval. So you want to analyze separately how things have changed over that time. So first, let's assume that, that within this interval that we're looking at, the things are basically constant. So the first thing you might try is to display an average photograph. And again, this isn't restricted to scientists. Artists can do this too. So there's an artist named Jason Salavan who makes these beautiful average photographs. Uh, so this is... And he has one of, of the late night trio, he calls it. Uh, so this is an average of Jay Leno during his monologue. <laughs> and here's an average of Conan O'Brien during his monologue. And you guessed it, uh, David Letterman during his monologue. And you, can, you don't have to go for TV, you can go for fine art. So these are uh, portraits by Rembrandt, Van Dyck, uh, Velasquez, and Hall. Uh, and I'm sure the art historians and the artists in the audience can easily uh, recognize the different styles that are revealed by this average photograph of all those. Um, another thing you can do by studying photographs over an interval of time is to combine anal analysis of shape with analysis of motion. So uh, here's another piece of work I was involved in. Uh, we called it shape time photography. So we used a stereo camera to get depth information as well as image information using computer vision methods. And this lets you tell a story with a single photograph that, that tells a story about actions and shapes that happened over some small interval. So let's look, for example, at a uh, quarter doing its little you know, death rattle on, on the table. So these are several pictures of that event. How can we combine all these photographs into a single photo. Well, we can average them. That's what we were just showing you. But, but then you lose the information. You lose the story about uh, which happened first. You lose the story about where they were. Everything's transparent. You lose contrast. Um, you can layer them by time. So you just put the first thing down and overwrite the second, overwrite the third. And that tells you a story about time, but it gets all confused with depth. And it's not anything you would actually see. But you can instead use computer vision methods, pull out the depth, and make a composite image of what those quarters would have looked like were they all present at the same time and all unioned together to form a single shape. We call that shape time photography, and we tried to uh, propose it as a way of telling little stories about 
things that happen over short intervals of time. So here's my wife sewing, and you can make a little story about how to sew. <laughs> and uh, here are two photographs of my brother-in-law. And I'm sure you're all wondering, God, what would that look like if his face was in the same place at the same time? Um, <laughs> so well, that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, okay. Now another thing you can do with a collection of photographs over an interval of time, if you assume there's this constant process going on, is, is pick out the best ones and, and tell a little story about uh, the best ones or, or something that happened at these little punctate intervals over it, over that time. So what am I talking about? Well, there's lucky imaging. And, and the talk before this was just an, an example of that. Um, here's a single exposure of very poor image quality of an a some astronomical object. Um, and here's uh, another single exposure taken at a different time of that same astronomical view. This is a slightly better picture than that one. So you can take 50,000 images and just average them all together and you get a picture like this. But if you just pick out the best ones, again, of that time interval, just pick out 500, which is only 1% of them, but the right 500, average those together, and you get a beautiful high-resolution image of the astronomical object you were looking at. Um, and so this has been used both in astronomy, also in uh, sort of more everyday photographic realm. This is uh, a nice paper by two people in the audience, Neil Joshi and Michael Cohen. Um, here's Here's a photograph of Mount Rainier <laughs> with a telephoto lens. Uh, here it is with some image processing, dehazed. But it's still got a lot of problems. You know, it's got a lot of noise there and kind of blurry. Um, so let's take the average of many of them dehazed. Well, it's better, but it's now it's really kind of blurry because they're all uh, translated as, as we just heard in previous talks. But if instead you grab local patches and ensure that they're all registered to each other when they put them back together, uh, then you can and uh, take care when you put, put them all back together, then you can make a single high resolution photograph, um, assuming that Mount Rainier looked the same over the period of time over which all the photographs were taken, and you get this uh, nice high resolution composite image. And you can take that down even further down to a human scale and if you have uh, photographs of a collection of people, you can select the ones where everyone was smiling, put them all together and make a composite. This is uh, from when Michael Cohen was still in his witness protection program. <laughs> 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 so he couldn't reveal his face, but um, that's the main idea. A and uh, he and collaborators uh, also explored this notion of what, what can you do with a stack of photographs and made these really beautiful stories composite photograph telling story of a child going uh, across the swing set. Um, and again, so this is photography telling a story on the order of seconds or minutes. Um, this was published in, in a nice SIGGRAPH paper, Interactive Digital Photo Montage, um, where you can, you can really, uh, you can modify the story you tell to make it be the, however you like. So here's a photograph of the building being demolished. You can enforce, uh, make time go across horizontally, uh, which as these co-authors did, uh, I'm not involved, um, but Asim and uh, Michael are in the audience. Um, and so time goes from left to right. And uh, so what's in involved in making this happen? You have to be able to register the images well. You have to be able to blend them together well. So there's both computer vision and computer graphics involved in creating these stories of, of uh, seconds to hours. But it's not just scientists who get to do this, artists do it too. So there's a wonderful artist uh, named Peter Funch. This is his web page. And he has done what I always wanted to do. So I always wanted to go to a plaza and take a movie camera and record people walking along for a long time and then make a single composite image where everybody in the plaza had their left foot up. I just thought that would be fun. <laughs> Well, he's done it. Uh, so he makes these beautiful composite images uh, from New York City. Here's a picture where everybody, except this perplexed guy in the center, <laughs> is jumping up in the air. Now, he doesn't describe how he makes these composites, but I assume he's doing just what I described, taking a large number of photographs on a tripod uh, over several hours, and then grabbing and compositing them together to make an image 
um, where everyone is in the right place, although they were all presumably there at different times. And so he's carried this uh, notion to a wonderful extreme. So here's a picture of New York City where everyone's carrying a yellow manila envelope. <laughs> and um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, for us photographers, this is interesting. Everyone's taking a picture. <laughs> this is Times Square, just maniacally being photographed. And this was fun. This next one's fun. Let me see how long it takes you to figure out what, what is common here. It's a world of children. Everyone's a child. Um, and another artist who does things in a related way is Cassandra C. Jones, who makes these wonderful found animations. So this one's an homage to Moybridge. I have to exit from uh, Keynote to show this. And okay, she's a CMU graduate. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here's a found animation of horses, um, a horse galloping, but of course it's not the same horse, it's many horses. So this is again this kind of lucky imaging type of compositing. Um, okay. Let's see, so I go over there. Oh, Anne, okay, here we're taking a slight, a slight break from the talk. These next two images have nothing to do with time, really, but I like them so much, and they're by this artist, that I wanted to show them to you, okay? <laughs> Short intermission. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a little bunny rabbit made out of lightning bolts. And she did, here's, a, here's a little squirrel. <laughs> So these are just great. OK, back to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you can also, of course, over this you know, seconds to hours interval, you can analyze how things have changed, not just assuming that everything's the same, but, but really amplifi amplifying and revealing to the viewer how things have changed. So in case there's anybody in the audience who hasn't seen this before, <laughs> I'm going to show it to you. Just out of curiosity, how many have not seen this yet? Okay, all right, all right. A couple of you, great. Um, so this is uh, motion magnification, uh, where we track, using computer vision methods, carefully done, we track feature points, we group them according to common motion, um, and then we interpolate between them to make a layered motion representation of the image. Then the user says, okay, take that red stuff and amplify its motion by a factor of 40. And so this makes a sort of motion microscope that lets you see small motions that you couldn't see otherwise. Now we're going to put it all back together. We take those pixels, we move them there, but ah, they're pushed beyond where we've seen data. So we use um, Alyosha's texture synthesis method to fill in uh, behind the missing points. And now we've made a motion microscope that let you reveal things that were going on during that time interval that you couldn't see otherwise. Um, and let's see, let me show you a more recent uh, picture. So this is. So that's amplifying just motion relative to no motion. You can also amplify motion relative to a different motion. So those two cars, uh, one the bottom, on the bottom has a full trunk, the one on the top has an empty trunk. We tracked both of them, and the thing you just saw was the unamplified track of them. So then we take those tracks, we register them, uh, warp them in time to be perfectly registered, and then we take the motion of one and amplify it relative to the motion of the other. And so we want to see what is it that one is doing more of than the other one is doing. And here's this sort of relative motion magnified output. And there you can see the one with the full trunk is bouncing a lot more than the other one. And uh, I won't show you the control that we did run where you do the processing uh, inverted one relative to the other. And it, it, it's, um, it, it, it does lead us to believe that we are indeed amplifying the fact that the, the one trunk was slightly fuller and uh, the car bounced more. And this motion magnification lets us see that extra bounce. OK, hours to months. So now we're slowing down even more. Now we're talking in the time range that's really uh, traditional time lapse. 
And I should say, to make things work here, now the, these later things are really much more, in my mind, much more computational than the earlier things, which were much more hardware oriented. Um, so to, 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 pro to process and reveal things about stuff that's going on in this realm, you need to track things, you need to know how things have changed relative to another, when you might have all the other confounding changes that are going on in that time interval. You might have lighting changes, you might have viewpoint changes, you might have uh, make of car changes, and you want to be able to analyze things at a high enough level that you can account for those and, and discount those unwanted changes and just reveal the changes that you're interested in. So uh, an early piece of work that is in along those lines is the uh, paper by Simsab Ali, Matusik, Feister, and Kiewicz, where they studied time lapse and tried to break it into um, constituent parts, where they're, this, so I'll show you in a second, the original, and then they, they were able to, by looking at the sequence over time, they can identify what parts were caused by shadow, and then take the, remove those components, and then look at the remaining components and do a low rank factorization of them to pull out lighting effects from uh, reflectance effects, and let you, uh, generate sequences that only show the changes uh, without any shadow changes or, or only reveal the reflectance changes. Uh, so this is, again, an attempt to, to take a sequence and, and pull out things that you couldn't ordinarily see. And again, this is, um, requires more, it's, it's more computational and intensive than the short time uh, photography work. Um, Ah, okay. And as I said, the sort of, uh, sort of the driver, this kind of technology underlying a lot of the processing that you would want to do with these very long time images are, are sort of fundamental computer vision technologies of tracking and alignment. <coughs> so just to get calibrated, I want to show you the state of the art in tracking to let you see where we are now. Now this is the published state of the art. So this is somebody else's paper implemented by somebody not in that group, um, which is different than the state of the art of what those people have in their binaries that they haven't really revealed to you in the publication. So uh, my graduate student, Michael Rubenstein, implemented the Broxham Malik tracker. When he first did it, it didn't work very well. He worked at it for another week or two and finally got it to work pretty well. So this is kind of the, the state of the art of what you can get from reading a paper and re-implementing it. Ah, and so here's a, um, I'm not sure what animal this is. Does anyone know? Cheetah, leopard, <laughs> cheetah? Okay, this is a cheetah, and we're tracking points here. The points are color-coded. They're color-coded by the, the so time is gonna progress from like green to uh, dark red and blue, and there should be a scale here showing that, and I'm sorry, I'll put it on next time. The color of the dot is the, is the indicates the time when we lose track on that dot. So originally, um, so, so, uh, You'd like for everything to be the color of the very last, you know, dark red, but it doesn't start out that way. Everything, uh, you'll see what gets lost. So let me show it here. Now here's what we can do now. Um, and actually this is, I should say, surprisingly good. Those, those things stay on, but um, it's not perfect. They're not red from the very beginning. Let me just show it one more time in case that's of interest. It does a good job in keeping track as this thing goes through all these shadows. I can test with that. And the, the technology, the main idea behind this is to put a, include rich descriptors for tracking feature points into a variational motion-based method, putting the two together, and it gives you this nice tracker. Um, okay, so, so again, the, the thing that you have to deal with and address in these long time scale time lapses is motion, how to put things in register, how to remove unwanted motions. So here's a, let me show you this time lapse. Here's some uh, sprouts growing. There's kind of two things going on that you can see. One are the, the, them growing, and the other is this very flapping around, this short-term motion that you could think of as motion noise. Of course, they do reveal things that are going on in biology, but, but it's at a different time scale. And let's say that we want to separate them out and look at them independently. Can we do that? Well, yes, we can. Uh, so we, we will consider the short-term variations to be noise and the long-term ones what we want to keep. So we're going to call this motion denoising, where you take away the random jitters of the motion signal and leave only the long-term motions. 
Uh, so we're going to re-render a sequence, and we're, we're going to keep with these ground rules. Again, this is a product placement. This is uh, from my group, um, Michael Ludenstein's first author. We want to re-render a sequence and only use pictures, pixels from this original video, but we're going to grab them from different positions and different times and put them all together. And how do we want them to look? We, so what we're searching for is this warp field, W. Um, we want the, and so I as a function of P plus the warp position is the output video. What are the characteristics we want of that output video? Well, we're going to make an energy function that defines what we want. We want it to look something like the input video. We didn't, we're not going to allow to make up crazy things. Uh, we also want that output video to be smooth over time. So its value relative to another val value at another time should be um, similar. And we also want the warp field to be regularized, to have it be spatially smooth. So this defines an energy function, which uh, defines a Markov random field in three dimensions, time being the third, that you want to solve for the lowest state. And the state dimension is pretty high. It's all the different times or positions that you might grab the pixel that you're going to put here in this time and place for every pixel at every time. Uh, so we solved this uh, Markov random field in several different ways. Compare the outputs. We did iterated conditional mode, grab graph cuts, and loopy belief propagation. For this problem, loopy belief propagation gave us the best answer. And so here's the result. So here's the original. Here's our motion denoised re-rendering of that time-lapse sequence. And then here is a little recipe that tells us how we got that motion denoised version from the original sequence. Uh, this tells us the spatial displacement that we used at every pixel. Here's a little map telling us how color relates to the actual spatial displacement. That's shown by these colors. And here's another map showing us the temporal displacement that we use for each pixel uh, future and past. Um, let me just show you that again. Now let me be the first to point out an artifact. We lose kind of the tips of the sprouts. Um, and that's because our search window was constrained to be small enough so that the thing worked in a few hours. Um, and if we broaden out our search window for how far away we're willing to look for the pixels that we should put at a certain position. Uh, so here's a small window where we can do that. Uh, here's with a large support window. You can see that we uh, regain those missing pieces of it. Uh, so the output sprouts look like the input sprouts. And here's, this is only limited for computational reasons. So you can break it in the, this image, the sequence, into short and long-term motion components. Here's the original. Here's the long-term motions of it. And here are the short-term motions of it. And you know, we're still working with this, but we, again, like, like the other things, we were seeking to reveal things over this time frame that you, you couldn't see just by looking at the ordinary time lapse. And um, just to repeat this again, so here's the source. There's several different ways you might imagine doing it, just as a sanity check. You can take the average over time to try to smooth things out, but that's going to be too blurred. You'll see in a second. You can take the median over time, which is better, but still not as good as our motion denoised output. Um, and then here you can kind of see that story in a spaced time picture for each of these different methods. Uh, the original choppy version in space time, the mean, the median, and the motion denoised. So this, this is where you can say, gee, is this really required by the plot that they spend so much time on this? But anyway, um, another one, New York City Street, long-term components, short-term components. These start to have some semantic differences between them. Um, here's one I like. This is a swimming pool being excavated. Uh, you can see this thing jiggle all around. And in the, the uh, motion denoised version, it's uh, nicely stabilized. Again, the long-term components of the swimming pool being dug and the short-term components. Uh, you can actually try to do some science with this. This is a uh, glacier sequence from courtesy of the Extreme Ice Survey. And the original time lapse sequence is really indeed quite noisy, and you really would like to smooth it out, make it easier to look at, easier to reveal the long term changes that you're looking for. Um, sorry, I wanted this one. And here we separate it out into short term and short term and long term components. Okay. Now we're going to slow it down even more. 
and we're going to go talk about things on the scale of years to centuries. How do you tell, how do you use photography to tell a story about events that happened over those time scales? Well, the first thing that you do to tell a story over events that happened over those time scales is just show photographs from a long time ago. That's one way to do it, and these are my favorite ones from a long time ago. These are these color photos that I think Alyosha uh, pointed out to us uh, by Prozidin Gorski. Um, they're, they're color. We kind of think of the world of long ago as being in black and white, but of course it was in color. And um, you know, what a wonderful way to tell a story about changes over time just to show these photographs from long ago. These are, of course, the, some of the world's first color artifacts <laughs> uh, <laughs> from the things that were moving uh, between, between the different uh, colored exposures. Another way to tell a story of changes over a very long time is to show two photographs of the same place side by side uh, from many years apart. So there's a nice book called New York Changing, which um, compares photographs taken in around 1936 with those taken in 1997 of the same place from the same viewpoint. And these are just wonderful to look at. Uh, so here's one from 1935, Manhattan Bridge looking up. There it is it's in the year 2000, not much change. Um, here's a view from the Manhattan Bridge, uh, again 1935. And what happens when you update that to modern times? Well, you get guardrails <laughs> and, and <laughs> chains and so forth, 2001. Um, here's one from 1936, and you have cars and uh, it's actually utility stuff uh, in 2001. So one, uh, you know, one computational thing that you'd like to be able to do would be to just have a nice image showing you, you know, cleanly without artifacts, what are all the objects that are present in one and not in the other, and what are all the objects that are present in the other and not in one. That's actually not that easy a problem. It'd be a nice. Uh, Nice task for a student to work on. Um, there is uh, some computational aspects of this have been worked on. Uh, this is not by my group, but by my colleague Fredo Durand and Asim Agarwal, who's also here. Um, computational re-photography. So part of the task of re-photography is getting in the exact same place with the exact same lens parameters as in the first photograph. So they use computer vision methods, uh, the kind of ways you would expect if you were a computer vision researcher to to automate that process. And so um, here's a reference photograph from long ago. Here's the re-photograph of it. Oh, sorry, this is not long ago. This is a test of whether or not it works. Um, and here's using their method, and here's a re-photograph of it using uh, non-computer vision-based methods. Um, and so here's, here's something really from long ago. This is a uh, reference photograph from olden times, their re-photograph, and then re-photographs made by other people uh, without the benefits of their computer vision methods. You can see they can just nail it, nail the viewpoint and the uh, camera parameters. Okay, so that's, that's a, still another way to tell a story over a long time. And then another way to tell a story of changes over a long time is to aggregate images from one time and aggregate the images from the other and compare those. So again, our friend uh, Jason Salavan made this uh, beautiful set of average photographs. This is the average class photos from the year of um, his parents' year of graduation from high school, 1967, and from his year of graduation from high school, uh, 1986. And again, this, this just tells a beautiful story. Um, so this did not use computer vision methods. Here's a, a, a wonderful project that, that did use very simple computer vision methods and which tells a, just a beautiful story of changes over time. And that's this um, Picasso face movie product. Let me go back to the internet and show you that. Um, mirror display. Um, here. You know, I, I used to get really depressed when I saw all this wave of people leaving. Then I remember, ah, it's the last day of the conference. People are going to their planes. So I'm assuming that's what everyone's doing when they're <laughs> walking out. <laughs> But um, this is worth staying for. So there's kind of some cheesy mu music that goes along with it, but you can just hum that in your head. <laughs> so this is the same girl growing up. 
So what's required to make this job? You have to recognize faces, you have to know something about the viewpoints that they're taken from, and then put them all together. And it's really straightforward work, and it's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful photographic method. Okay, beyond centuries. Well, I'm not sure how to do things beyond centuries. Um, there's the 10,000 year clock project, uh, which uh, I'm not sure what state it's in, but they, they want to build a clock that lasts for 10,000 years. Um, so certainly when you get up to centuries, it becomes a hardware project again, not just computational again. Uh, but wouldn't it be exciting to make a time capsule that was photographing the world during that whole time of being encased in the time capsule? So, to sum it up, um, oh, sorry, a few more things I wanted to say. When also, when you look at people, like the, the ones of the, the girl growing up is one thing of interest over time. Another thing of interest over time are health applications. You'd like to have a camera uh, in your bathroom which looks at you every day and just checks you out. In the privacy of your, rest, in your bathroom, checks for moles that change. Uh, that's, a, I think, a real solid application of computer vision technology over telling a story over time that's very important. Um, I think that these things are a little weaker than these are as far as they're knock your socks off, this is incredible, I've never seen this before type of stuff. And I think, but at the same time, there's a lot more we can do, these are being, advances in the long time photography is being driven by advances in computer vision. And uh, advances in alignment, in long term tracking uh, will help with these, and also uh, computer vision for recognition in these automatic search and selection of the, the images that you want to composite together. All that will make the stories we can tell over these long time intervals uh, be stronger. So again, we want to identify changes that are independent of lighting, independent of viewpoint, independent of changes of the make of the car, just identify it's a car and select things uh, to, to remove those unwanted changes over time to just reveal the changes that you're interested in. And, and also, I think uh, some, uh, uh, an area that we haven't explored much is real statistical analysis on these small changes over time. Um, surely there's a lot we can do if we take 10 years worth of in images and analyze them carefully, statistically, uh, making sure that everything's registered together so we're combining the right thing. So that's all for us to do, and thank you for your attention. Which I guess also tells a story over time. It tells a story of the universe over time. So yeah. Yes. Have you tried your motion denoising on satellite images of the Earth? Um, no. We, we sort of this motion denoising will just be published in June. We haven't really released it yet. So uh, we're eager for good possible applications. So. Um, if you have something particular in mind, just send me an email. Well, you could watch glacial melting. I mean, you already showed glacial melting, but you could maybe watch uh, crops over time. And right, right. Changes in flow clean, changes in climate. Right. Oh, sorry. And it would take days and days and days. I never hmm. thought of it as an average photograph. I thought of it as a really, really early hmm. poor photograph. Yeah, that's nice. That's true. That's good. So I, I also have a more philosophical question. Yes. So it, in, a, in a way, um, uh, we humans, the way we, we capture images, the way we see it is not really the way like a shutter comes down. 
right? There is there is some temporal mm -hmm. issues in you know the saccadic movement and how how you basically splice the different parts of your visual field and then yeah. combine it together. And even in the longer scale, there are some you know like the the, the change blindness of course. Yeah. You know, that uh, you have um, some things that we are we notice and other things we don't notice. So can you kind of project this onto the more human dimension? Oh, and that's great. Like the idea of, you know, the philo philosophy of time. What is, what are the, the, the time that we see versus the time that we don't see? I think that's great. Um, so it's like we've, with photography, we've captured the optics part of it, but we haven't captured the memory part of it. Um, and yeah, no, I think that's perfect. Um, I mean, there's, again, it requires really knowing what you're looking at. To, to kind of know what's important, what's not important, what to put into your memory, but um, surely that will, surely that will become a part of photography too. That'd be neat. Maybe combining with some of the work in the eye tracking. Yeah, what's important? Right. <coughs> yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And that would be very fascinating as well to see how stuff can be archival. Yeah, oh, that's a, that's great. Purity. Yeah, and I guess one change. Um, so I used to work at Polaroid. Remember Polaroid? <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I was working at Polaroid, it was just the coolest thing to take a Polaroid camera and take it to a party. Everyone was just bonkers over, like, wow, look at these pictures. There's so and so, ah, you know. <laughs> and so, so I bought some Polaroid film recently. You can still get it on eBay. And, and, and took it to a, like a, some meeting, uh, you know, a party of, of, of uh, not a party, but uh, some gathering of graduate students for someone's graduation. And, and took around there and took pictures. And it was just, it just fell flat. You know, they, just, they were just not excited about this thing with instant film because they've already experienced that instant image thing, you know, with the phone that's in everybody's pocket. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, well let's thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Whose laser pointer was it? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.